Hello everybody, it's James Chai, Arf Arf Bark Bark Rescue Foundation, registered nonprofit, and I am the guy that works with extremely dangerous dogs, predatorial dogs, and what may sound impossible, anyone can learn to do that with just simple tools. So um, today, this is episode, uh, I believe, number eight, and um, October 2nd, and I'm just going to be starting to um, talk about some of the things uh, that I have, um, and I'm going to kind of be a little bit over the place today because I I want to answer some people's questions when I posted earlier, what they would like to hear or have discussed and so forth like that. One of the things I do want to say right off the bat, um, in a in a group, and I'll put the link in my uh, in my group here, is for Peace Love Danes. It's a Great Dane uh, group, and uh, they posted a picture here, a shared picture of uh, of a of a dog. I, I don't know what breed it is. It's a German Shepherd or something. And uh, has a chuck it ball, one of those you know orange hard, uh, blue hard balls that people throw around like a tennis ball. And uh, the dog has it lodged in their throat, which they're at the vet, and thankfully they're at the vet. So um, just so you're aware that if your dog is playing with a toy, make sure the size is bigger than that your dog can swallow. And as well, make sure that if you give them a tennis ball or anything that can be torn apart, that you keep an eye on those pieces because even the smaller pieces can break apart and become lodged in your dog's throat, uh, suffocating them to death. And uh, I don't mean to be graphic. Uh, don't mean, thanks, Rita. Uh, I don't mean to be graphic. Unfortunately, uh, the dog does suffocate to death, and that death is uh, about three minutes long, and it's extremely horrifying because, uh, unfortunately, your dog doesn't know what's going on, can't breathe, and as their body shuts down, then it's, uh, it's quite dumb. Uh, quite despairing so um, there's that part so again it's in peace love Danes and, and I'll, I'll go over that part um, a couple of things here I, I, I want to mention um, you know I, I get some flack every once in a while about this aspect of science-based uh, training and the science-based training I want to kind of address that part of it now science is science it is the study of things on a logical or analytical process to discover whether or not something is true or not true. If it's proven true, then the rest of the uh, science industry in that particular field will then pursue it as hard as they can to disprove it. Because it's not because they're being malicious, but it's because they want to say this is absolutely correct. If we can prove that it's correct, then we go onward and we're happy. Uh, when it comes to dog training, the science is not there. And it's unfortunate because a lot of people are pursuing this misguided belief that science uh, of dogs is, is intransient. That, in other words, that there's only one way to address the dog, and that's with treats. So it's a, uh, earlier today, I read a ridiculously uh, 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 unskilled article in the Huffington Post talking about treat training a dog is the way to do it. And it's the only way that works. And that includes dysfunctional dogs. Now, for lower level dysfunctional dogs, treat training, you can still get away with that and that's nothing wrong with that, that's great. On a professional basis, when it comes to higher level dysfunctions, dogs that are extremely dangerous uh, to predatorial, anybody who has an extremely dangerous or dangerous dog, has a skittish dog, has a highly reactive dog, will say the same thing with me. Treats don't work. So that science is debunked. The science is completely destroyed for treat training. As I've said before in previous posts, treat training is a theory predicated on Ivan Pavlov back 122 years ago in 1897, and uh, that's when people owned slaves. So we're, we're we're following that rule, and at the same time, that's when women couldn't vote. So, uh, which is uh, the irony is, you know, the majority of dog trainers are female. So it's kind of like why are women following the same path of somewhat tacit or you know very loosely. Uh, uh, um, you know, connected um, subjugation of behavior, and it just doesn't make sense. Also, the part about science-based training, there is no science-based because the problem is they're trying to quote-unquote fix a dog by giving them treats. And as well, food does not exist as a communication device anywhere in the canine species, yet society is still trying to say, hey, you know what, this dog is dumb enough to take food and it's dysfunctional, so that's what happens. But the reality is, if there's a problem with your dog, it's behavioral, correct? Behavior. Behavior is not cut and dry. Behavior is not A to B. Behavior is A to Z, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, etc. All through the entire aspects, all the dysfunctions, all the spectrum. Dogs and humans coexist, cohabitate, 
So how can the dog exist as a linear object, as an analog, as a dumb animal, yet have such affection and emotion for human beings that we have this incredible love for them, but then we're still saying dogs are dumb and stupid, and here's a treat because you're dumb and stupid. You're reacting, so here's some food. You're dumb and stupid. Oh, you didn't work? You, you didn't respond to the food? Oh, but you're still trying to attack other dogs and people? And But you won't here, take another treat. Yo, you won't take the treat? We have to kill you. Do you see the, the irony in all of that? So the science-based aspects of treat training a dysfunctional, higher level dysfunctional dog is debunked. Again, nowhere in the canine species is food used as a communication device by any dog, any wolf, any, any hyena, nothing. In fact, that is an aspect of dominance and so forth like that, that, that silly word dominance, but it's all that aspect of those things where it just doesn't exist, it's not used, but again, brute force in it, you know, the anthropomorphization of ego and guilt and lack of understanding dogs, this is what science does, it keeps pushing and pushing and pushing and saying, you know what, it is treats, 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 treats. When was the last time that you had a depression or a psychological issue, anxiety, trauma, and someone gave you food. The analogy that I use, you're a passenger in a vehicle and you're with a driver, an excellent driver, and just an amazing driver, and you're going through an intersection, a busy intersection, your light's green, and you go through the intersection and suddenly some Yahoo runs the red light and hits your side of the car, the passenger side of the car. Not the driver's fault at all. You guys got a green light, the guy runs a red light. You can't predict that, that happens. You go to the hospital and you're in the hospital for months trying to recover, trying to learn how to walk again, trying to learn how to, to feed yourself with a spoon. You finally get out of the hospital four or five months later. You're back in the car driving home because that's the only way you're going to get home. So you're back in the car. You're already afraid. Behaviorally, psychologically, you're already afraid, just like the dog. And then you're driving, and your driver takes you back through the same intersection, and you recognize that same intersection. And as you get closer to that intersection, what's going to happen? You're going to panic and you're going to freak out. You're going to be like, oh gosh, oh gosh, please don't go through this intersection. Please don't go through this intersection. This is where I got hit and I had to go to the hospital for six months and learn how to, how to use my own spoon again and how to read and, and I mean, how to, how to eat everything again. Please don't go. And as you're panicking, he goes, oh no, it's okay. Don't worry about it. We're going to take you through the intersection. And as you're going through the intersection, as you're starting to panic, the driver hands you an ice cream cone. The driver hands you a treat. What would you do at that moment? Exactly. Science continues to believe this archaic, suppressed belief that dogs respond to food. Dysfunctional dogs respond to food. When it comes to obedience training, trick training, show, search and rescue, food is an excellent source of compliance to motivate the dog to comply, right? Give them a treat, the dog does something, yahoo! When it comes to dysfunctions, when it comes to psychological issues, giving a dog a treat is about as smart as riding a tricycle with two wheels. So that's that's where I want to address, and I'm going to keep going on that in the future as well as science keeps going on. And I actually emailed the uh, one of the uh, the authorities, one of the science authorities. Uh, in the Huffington Post, and we'll see if she responds. I doubt she'll respond. Uh, what I've been told is a lot of scientists, if they're proven wrong. They're not going to go and say, hey, you know what, you proved me wrong. Go go tell me why I'm wrong so I can be debunked in front of my, my public. Instead, they're just going to say nothing. But again, take a look at that. Treat training someone with dysfunctions. Next time you have an argument with somebody and they're getting pissed off, give them a cookie. See how long that lasts. But again, we think it's okay to do that with dogs. We think that if the dog's having a behavior, they're going to freak out. Oh, well, we'll give them a treat. If that doesn't happen, then we'll use a prong collar or a shock collar and we'll brute force them. That's what we call, that's what I call archaic. When I see and hear stuff like that from known trainers and so forth, and thankfully there are trainers that are contacting me now who are admitting that, you know what, it's not right, it doesn't make sense. Why is your method working 100% of the time? The science method that they're following is only working 60% with the reactive dogs. When it comes to dogs that are predatory, dangerous even, they're getting killed. So trainers are relying on a 60% success rate. 
saying that that's science, start addressing the psychology. Start addressing the psychology of the dog. And the problem why science doesn't do that is because they don't understand and they don't believe that dogs have a sentience. And if you don't believe a dog has a sentience, then how are you going to fix the dog? That's a situation. So it goes back to another part here in regards to alpha. And I want to correct that term in my perspective, alpha. Alpha should not be used. Dominance should not be used. And I, and I myself am low to use these terms because, unfortunately, it's what the industry has circulated as common discussion, but it's not accurate. Dogs are overt codependent. Humans are covert codependent. We, we exist, cohabitate, emotional isomorphism, as I've said before. We live off each other. We depend on each other. Codependency. Although the dog seems like as though they have to rely on us more than us on them, in the wild, the dog's going to survive when we won't. In the house, the dog survives basis on our good will to them. I call that not pack animals, not, not, I call it familial, family. So I always refer to that part of the dog being part of my family, of the dog and I being bonded in that sense of family. And when I start using that terminology in my head when I'm working with dogs, then it makes it much more easier to work with my dogs because then I'm referring to them in a more emotionally franchised feeling. Like I, I'm connected to them. Just like the other day, my post was talking about um, dogs barking out the window. Instead of using language like stop barking, stop, I say stop yelling. And if you look at the feedback on some of the comments on that post, people have been using it and they are finding a different response from their dog, which is more receptive than before. And they're not using any treats, anything at all like that. So get away from using the word alpha. Get away from the word using dominant. And that's, it's throughout everywhere. I've seen it several times today. Get away from that part and just talk to your dog in the sense in your own head of just, this is my friend. This is another sentient being that understands what I'm talking about. And then you'll start to understand that there's a bit of a shift on how we approach dogs and how we are able to address dogs. Once you do that, then it's going to be awesome and you'll be able to work forward. This is exactly the same thing. This is exactly the same thing. Like when it comes to dangerous dogs, predatorial dogs, giant dogs, you've seen the, my post, you've seen the proof of it. Dogs that have attacked 16 people, dogs that have attacked 4 or 5 people, dogs that I've worked with other owners that have attacked people declared dangerous by animal control. I've worked with them all. I have a 100% success rate because I'm approaching the dog with a familial adherence to their behavior. And the dog understands that. The pack, yes, the pack mentality. But we bring that more into the visceral than the dog emotionally is connected with us and then we understand what's going on with the dog how to address the dog psychologically as well um somebody else here uh, i think rita it was you uh, uh over there in norway and, and thank you so much for staying up so late to, or getting up so early to watch my episode on on it um the other thing i want to ask people is please share my posts please sh subscribe to my youtube channel i can keep talking and talking about all this and uh, people are watching it but not enough people. And I don't charge for this. I don't charge on my website. There's no ads. I don't charge for anything. I do a significant amount of pro bono annually. I do more in a month than most behaviors and trainers do in a, in, in, a, in a year. So please help me by sharing my posts. Please help me by subscribing to my YouTube channel. The links are in my description, all my posts now. And this way you can help me just get the word out to save other dogs' lives. And I, and I think, Rita, you also had a friend of yours who has some issues with her dog, which I said I'd be happy to help. Um, okay, so uh, what you had said, Rita, as well, was regards to Minky. Um, oh, sorry, okay, so we just clicked out here for a second. Uh, bad uh, reception here. Um, uh, so, okay, yeah, right, me, Rita. So, so Minky the Jindo, Animal Hope and Wellness Foundation, has rescued over 20,000 dogs. Over 20,000 dogs. They've, they've taken meat dogs. They've taken in dogs from all over uh, California. Dogs that are in horrific traumatic uh, experiences, uh, injuries, and so forth. And out of all those tens of thousands of dogs, 
Mickey was the one dog that none of them at Animal Hope and Wellness Foundation could address, including the board of directors that has a, a well-known trainer on it. There's behaviors locally, etc., etc., because everybody was trying the same old, same old treat training. The dog doesn't work. Okay, well, whatever. And because Animal Hope and Wellness Foundation has a no-kill policy, that's why Mickey didn't get killed. So, uh, for, uh, uh, Adet, let me just see what you're just saying here, Adet, because I want to ask you all uh, live. Um, Adet says, Odette says, I think that in some cases treats can work, not if the animal is in a higher level of frustration, anxiety. Exactly what I was saying in regards to lower level dysfunctions with dogs. Absolutely, it's a great compliance aspect when it's complicated dysfunctions, when the psychological issues are submerged, like an iceberg. Treats aren't going to work. It's like the drug addict taking more drugs and they never mature. They're, they're stuck in there. Uh, what else do you say? We, 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 with real aggressive dogs and sea lions, treats work for us to get in the water and perform uh, water work with them. When for years trainers couldn't get in the water because when you went to the hospital, if you were lucky, don't you think that during the process, treats can help if you do it in super small approximations? Yes, you can do that. But also, here's the thing about it too, and I've seen other animals. I, I've worked with alpacas as well. Um, there is a functional component of the psychology that the dog animal sentient exists in. Their behaviors. With the dogs themselves, I've already noticed the fact that dogs react at one-tenth of a second. So it's that part of addressing those issues on the dog's behavior. I'm seeing what is behaviorally indigenous to the, do uh, to the dog, to the animal. Those behaviors that are indigenous, we work from there. And we understand the envelope of what's going on if we start looking for it at one-tenth of a second. Um, going back to Minky, so with Minky, he wasn't able to be addressed. And there's four videos there of Minky's behavior. You can see what Mark Ching, the founder of Animal Hope and Wellness, said. He said it's it's unbelievable. He could not believe how fast it happened in such a short time frame, which is 36 hours. Uh, what their foundation couldn't do in four hours. And Animal Hope and Wellness Foundation is uh, is the is it charity that actually got HR 6720 passed in the US Senate which criminalizes dog and cat meat so they have some pretty heavy pretty deep uh, uh, connections to be able to get that to go forth so they have that influence and despite that influence uh, it was difficult for them to understand and ascertain what Minky's issues were and I said to them over the phone and through messages this is what Minky's issues are and like well yeah that sounds right and I said yeah and this is what his issue is blah 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 and they said well can you fix him and I said yeah, he's just an average. He's like a 6 out of 10 on my scale. He's an average dog. And he went, okay, well, good luck. And we'll send him up to you. And I said, okay, send him up to me. We need to do this and this and this. And then they said to me, this is the first time we've ever sent any dog away for rehabilitation in our history. So 20,000 plus dogs, they asked me to do so. They sent him to me when they don't normally do that, ever do that. I brought him up here. You see the videos. He's reactive. He's covered in his own feces, et cetera, et cetera. I'm always concerned about being attacked, and I bring him in, and I am taking aspects of trust by watching his behavior. So, Odette, you can take a look at that video. I'll put it in, in my comments when I finish reading this and reviewing it, and then you see how it works. But with Minky, you can see in the third video, Rita, where I follow and determine his voice key when he's on the board, uh, the floorboards of my vehicle. And I'm saying his name, hi, Minky, hey, Minky, hi, silly boy. And you see me fluctuating and fluctuating. And as I fluctuate that tone and the cadence and the intonation and the length and the rhythm and yada, 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 you'll see me determining what he's already doing within probably about 20, 25 seconds. I've read, oh, you're welcome. Um, I, I, and I've already determined what he's doing in 20 to 25 seconds, how to hit his voice key. Hi, Minky, hi, silly boy, hi, silly boy. He's right here, he heard his name because... Always use your dog's name. I'm always using their name so they understand who they are. Uh, I'll get into that in another time because I think I'm going to end up going to like 30, 40 minutes. Exactly, Rita. Yeah, because they're so upset. They're not really paying attention to the food. They're not food motivated. It's a dysfunction. If you were scared of something, you're not going to have a treat. You're not going to eat something when you're scared. Maybe when you're depressed, you have food as a comfort food, but not when you're upset behaviorally. You're going to be like, ah, I got to concentrate. Long, long story. I'll keep going on this, and I'll keep going on this, and I'll keep going on this. Okay. So, um, Minky, so that's the situation with Minky. You can see the second, third, and fourth video. One of the things I might do is I might go over some of the videos I've done and explain to people and so that they understand it's not some sort of misnomer as trigger stacking and all these things. 
like alpha dominant trigger stacking uh uh i don't know what flooding and all these dumb statements that these people who who couldn't handle a dog over a v v5 on my scale but they have these incredible attitudes yeah i got yeah right i got him into the car seat i mean and I, that was a huge risk but it's something that i had to work with him and watch his behavior and talk to him and and work that tone but again, just getting back to the part is when you get a trainer of behavior that is saying stuff like that and they're talking about behavioral euthanasia, that's the trainer that you want to kind of walk away from. That's the trainer that says to you, if I can't succeed with your dog, I'm going to say your dog has behavioral issues and needs behavioral euthanasia. That's sacrificing your dog's life at the expense of that trainer's ego, that behaviorist's ego. Like I said, there's a behaviorist here in town. Um, she has a, uh, uh, they're on YouTube, on my Arf Arf Bark Bark Rescue Foundation on, on YouTube. The link is in my um, um, in my description, Tanya. Um, like I said, there's a behaviorist in town here. She has a newspaper column. She writes uh, for a large major newspaper. She is actually consulted by, by animal control regionally. She's consulted for provincially. She's consulted nationally she's consulted in the states and in actual fact i sent her a, a tweet off of one of the things that she said and she blocked me there you go and she charged i think 300 she used to charge 400 dollars an hour till i forced the prices down here as well locally um so now i think yeah she used to charge for it now she charged 300 and then there's another another behavior here in town and and the biggest problem is that they're living on academia and they're living on their reputation. And when they're faced with a dog like Minky, medicate him or kill him. That's 60% success rate. But she's making two, $300,000 a year. What is going on is because we're trying to save our egos at the expense of our dogs by not admitting the fact that we don't know what we're doing, that we're limited in science, and that we're at the end of our rope. And instead, we're going to kill the animal. So, uh, sorry, I just want to make sure I'm keeping up with the comments here. Um, so, so there's that part. Uh, maybe, again, we'll talk about Minky. I have a Cody the Jindo video, uh, and that one's been finished uh, for about a month. And so I haven't, I keep forgetting to post it. And um, Cody the Jindo, he used to be called Alex. And uh, he's from Naomi Kim's Save Korean Dogs. And he was in rescue for two and a half years, literally in rescue from, from Korea to LA, to Vancouver, uh, he could not be touched, he could not do anything, nothing could happen whatsoever. He would freak out on leash, he would bite through the leash, if it was a chain leash, he would end up biting until his mouth bled, and he would continue to freak out, etc, etc. And in one session, I was able to get him outside of the foster's home, walking around without darting, without being fearful, listening to his foster and all that, and actually one of the uh, well-known vets out in Richmond at a large animal hospital had suggested because the person uh, the foster had said hey you know I need some help had suggested um, you know going to uh, a certain behaviorist for help which would have just ended up being Cody being medicated that's horrible it's it's disgusting for somebody like me to see that that's disgusting to medicate a dog, to put them into a fog with pharmaceuticals that have never been proven fully through clinically to throw your dog onto medication because you don't know what's going on. That's what would have happened. Yesterday I had a discussion with a, with a great young couple um, who have a dog as well who's reactive. And uh, this couple, they've seen a behaviors, so the same well-known behaviors. They have uh, also seen a well-known trainer as well. And the trainer is saying these things. You know what? That trainer is unskilled because she doesn't know what she's talking about and she was voted one, number one or number two in, in Vancouver here uh, and I said she's just she doesn't know what she's talking about she's trying to treat train and then she's talking about the, him being regressive and all that stuff there's no such thing as regressive with a dog there's no such thing as regressive with a cognizant human being that regression is not regression it's just falling back into the old habits no it's relying on the past which works so to the dog as i said before a dog process time through abstract memory as if a slideshow and that's in another episode i think the second episode that i did 
I know I get really complicated because I'm talking about the true psychological, the, the psychogenetic aspects of the dogs. So anyhow, uh, you know, she's talking about the, the regression all stuff, and I said, no, it's this is just silly. And the same thing with the medication and all that stuff. And they've been able to take their dog out in public without him trying to attack other dogs. Dogs have come up to their dog and sniffed his, their dog, and their dog is just standing there like, okay, and looking at their dad like and mom like, what's going on? Why am I not getting upset? One session. Even though I say it's one session for what I do with people, it's dogs, it's a matter of practice, practice, practice with a human being. It's the matter of treating the dog as a family member. Referring to the dog with their name. All these things that go on, and I'll use that next time about your why your dog should use their name. So we go through Alpha, we went through Science, went through Minky, went through Peace, Love, Danes, and the tennis ball. Uh, I want to say thank you to John Pollock. Um, I'm not sure where you are, John, because I have to go to your, your, your post here. Um, you're two hours away from me. I've seen a veterinary behaviorist and have tried everything possible to help one of my dogs who is extremely dog aggressive. They have just started her on low and reluctantly to try to change her behavior. Okay, Tanya, what is what is your dog doing? This is great. I, you know, I don't mind interrupting and stopping this, Tanya, because I'd rather do a live organic evaluation than just kind of go through all the other stuff as well. So I'll give you some time to respond to that. Um, in regards to veterinary behaviors, and I've tried everything possible to help one of the dogs who is extremely dog, uh, one of my dogs who is extremely dog aggressive. So I'm guessing that you have at least three dogs, and that this dog is probably uh, uh, second, third in your tier, and um, uh, the reaction on that part. Yeah, okay. Once you send me a little bit more information, I'll go on that. So okay. So John has said, uh, uh, you know, um, he tried calling me earlier. I was grocery shopping because I have to eat. Bought some really cool vegan um, uh, chicken nuggets, which is great because uh, it's been like four years since I've eaten meat. Uh, I, I, you know, I'm not proselytizing. I'm just saying I don't eat meat because after working with dogs that are extremely victimized, extremely traumatized, it was hard for me in good faith to continue eating meat. Um, and I don't mind it though, you know, um, you know, it, it's kind of tough. Uh, but it's, it's worth it. Okay, so um, what did you say here? Uh, John says, I have some thoughts, but more importantly, okay, um, I think we work with dogs on the opposite sides of the spectrum. We, can, we can't foster anymore as we have three Danes and a Mastiff in a 1,500 square foot home and a small yard. Uh, that's cool, John. I, I'm renting an old house that's about 60 years old on well water and a septic tank, and I've got about 600 square feet with three Great Danes as well, uh, Minky the Jindo as well as uh, little Sammy, who's got the two legs. So I, I do understand your pain. Um, okay, so we fostered 16 of them and kept five. And that's awesome because you're following through with that, what I said the other time in another episode uh, about having everyone should have five dogs. So that's awesome. Our pups were all very shy and abused. Uh, and, you know, uh, I just want to say for people who adopt dogs that have behavioral issues, people who are like at Second Chance in Life and Kugo, and, uh, and those type of uh, rescues, they're bringing in dogs that have been traumatized. They're bringing in dogs that have behavioral issues. And then the people like you who are adopting these traumatized dogs, knowing that they're traumatized, thank you. You're taking the challenge, because there's a lot of people who just want the perfect dog, no issues, why is this dog being like this, or might have a few little issues, etc. Uh, for people who are taking dogs and adopting them into their home as part of their family, knowing that their dog that is now part of their family has behavioral issues and are willing to, to just change their entire life, thank you. It's a big, big step to take. Okay, um, bring them out of the shells. Uh, our pups were all very shy abused. I was able to bring... Uh, okay, just a second, Tanya. Um, our pups were all very shy abused. I was able to bring them out of their shells and find homes, but a third of them stayed, right? The five out of the 15. Uh, I'm not good at fostering. I tend to keep them. Who doesn't? Watching your videos, I agree. I talk to them. No high-pitched tone of voice. Exactly. We don't want to use a high-pitched tone of voice. And John, this is great great information to talk about. We don't want to use a high-pitched tone of voice because it's disingenuous. Imagine if you're going to a restaurant, and so I use these analogies that I use in person, so I use these analogies, uh, human analogies. You're going to a restaurant, and the waiter comes up to you and goes, Hi, how are you today? Oh, we've got these great specials on, we love it. Right off the bat, you know, one, please just leave. Two, please just leave. 
because you know it's disingenuous. They're just trying to be nice. It's fake, they, right? I mean, well, most times it's fake, and they're just trying to, you know, just do their job and, 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 and pay their bills. When you have somebody come up to you and says, hi, how are you? Uh, my name is James, and I would like to just let you know what we have on today. And then you say to him, oh, what do you think of uh, this dish? And, he, and, the, and if I was to say, well, you know what? The dish isn't that great. I'd try something else. Right off the bat, you're going to be like, yeah, I trust you. But I'm like, yeah, this dish is not that great. I, I, you should try something else. You're just going to go, whatever, right? So the high-pitched tone of voice is disingenuous. And when you go to the dog park, pay attention to how many people talk to their dog like that. Hi, how come you like that? The dog no longer listens. It just goes on. And, and, and we'll, we'll talk about that another organic time because I want to stay on topic here. Uh, I believe in socializing in situations where it's a win for the pups. I saw your video on dominance. I prefer uh, uh, the other structure, um, you know, and, and you're the lead. He says, uh, I'm the leader of the pack. They trust me. I will not put them into a bad situation. And that's a great point, too, as well, because our dog is relying on us being covert, uh, sorry, overt codependence. Our dog is relying on us to protect them. That's it. Same thing. So that, that's why I say the pack and the alpha and the dominant aspect, it's a misnomer. It's misguided because the, your dog is looking for us for you to protect you, uh, for you to protect them. So it's not a dominant aspect of it. Your dog is just, protect me. Don't be my leader and don't treat me like that, but just protect me. If we were in an actual relationship with somebody, if I was going out with someone and she was dominant in that sense of it and, and telling me what to do all the time and actually I did go out with somebody and it was a horrific feeling, um, you just feel devalued. You feel like somebody just doesn't trust you. And I mean, I've got, I've been very fortunate to go out with some very successful people, um, some well-known publicists and so forth like that, who have some really deep political ties and all that stuff. And you get treated, I got treated like I was arm candy and it's horrible. It's, it's devaluing. It just makes you feel awful about yourself. And I myself was just like, this is horrible. I thought it'd be cool, but this is horrible. So if I don't like it, why would I do it to my dogs? If I don't like someone to dominate me uh, or, or, or to be alpha in, in that sense in a regular relationship, how can I enjoy that when I'm doing it to my dogs? But if I talk to them and I use my voice and I talk to them in regular tones and I say, stop yelling at, out the window. And like last night, you saw the video where I'm talking. Mickey's making the growling noise as he's getting reactive to the other dogs. And that's it. That's him getting reactive to the other dog about to get into a fight. And what did I do? I just went, Mickey, stop it. And he stopped. No fight. And there was a beef bone, a raw beef bone on the ground. And that's what they were arguing about. Just a simple discussion. Because I'm talking to them with respect, love, sentience. So, okay. Um, so, uh, sorry, I'll go back on. So, not trust me to put me in a bad situation. So, you're actually their parent, John. Okay, one dame that stayed was young, two years old. She was trying to figure out her position in the pack. She went after our blind 10-year-old Great Dane. And I grabbed her by the scruff and gave her a serious scolding. So when it comes to that part in regards to the two-year-old and she went after your blind uh, Dane. Hey, Chuck. Um, Chuck, you got some mail. Uh, so went after that, that blind Dane, the 10-year-old. The reason why is because dogs don't mimic. Dogs watch behavior. Dogs watch behavior. They watch cadence. They watch gait. They watch everything. They understand when somebody is not walking, quote unquote, normally. That's why people say, you know, oh, my dog's great with every dog and every human being. But if there's a guy walking with a cane or a lady walking with a cane, my dog goes crazy and he, my dog's never been beaten. The gait has changed. The structure of that walk has changed. So that's what I'm saying. So, um, uh, so could have been possibly, you're welcome, man. Uh, that could have been possibly where, again, um, your two-year-old, uh, didn't know what was going on with your blind uh, Dane and just interpreted it as just an odd type of behavior that is not uh, indigenous and that is not germane to the pack itself, to the family itself. So so that could be the part. So uh, you grabbed her by the scuff, gave her a serious scolding. Now, uh, and then she ran to the bedroom. Good. Right. So we don't want our dog to run away in that event either. Because if we get them to run away, then they fear us. And if you've ever tried to intimidate somebody or you've been in a relationship where somebody is intimidating you or you work for a boss that is intimidating, you're in fear all the time. And you don't feel relaxed, you don't feel organic, you don't feel respected. So what we want to do is we want to, we can give our dog, heck, hey, I, I've yelled at my dogs myself. 
not just a yelling out the window thing. I've yelled at them for doing this or getting to a fight or whatever it is. And then right away, I just say, okay, thank you. Just like I did the other day when William was drinking water or whatever it was. And, he said, blah, 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 and I went, William, stop. And he stopped right away. I went, thank you. So I'm acknowledging everything that they do because the dog is reacting at one-tenth of a second. We're asking them to do something. The dog is complying. We have to say thank you for complying because we've asked them to do something. They did it. We need to say thank you. It's respect. It's reciprocal, but it maintains that relationship. And so that's what's really super duper important. Um, I can't go into specific details because then we'll be talking 17 hours later from now because you know me. Um, okay, so I followed that up with some more scolding. Um, you know, it's okay to do more scolding if it's bad. And it sounds like it was bad because uh, she went after your blind Dane. And, you know, imagine being blind and having someone beat you up. That's horrific. So I, I do understand that. Um, uh, yeah, and don't believe in hitting dogs. That's excellent. That does no good. She stayed in her room for the rest of the day. So what you would do next time, and she's really sensitive. So she's always waiting for the hammer to, to, to fall, like the Queen song, right? Uh, the hammer to fall. She's uh, Now that Dane, is uh, that, that the two-year-old, is waiting to get in trouble again. So she's in fear of being in trouble. And that's probably, I haven't read the rest of the list, but that's probably why she's probably going to be somewhat skittish. In her behavior especially around you because she's like okay he freaked out on me and he continued to freak out on me and then he didn't bring me back into the family now i feel bad right so uh, and and you john for yourself don't you know don't dwell on the past don't think about what you've done in the past now you know that as a foundation move that forward and when you move that forward then you use that as a positive right we want to make lemonade everything absolutely everything has to be lemonade um, you know, uh, you know, again, like when I was going out with that person and she was quite dominant in that behavior, uh, you know, cause she, um, um, uh, she was quite high, high up in her, um, corporate, uh, ladder. Um, you know, it, 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 it's being respected and you want to be respected on that part of it. And you want to be able to be understood and you want to be able to work back and forth. And for the dog themselves, they want to be understood. Your dog wants you to understand them. Your dog also wants to know when you're wrong. Your dog wants to have you recognize when you've kind of screwed up. And you will go back, for example, with, with the, your two-year-old. And there's no names here, so unfortunately, I can't refer to too much. Uh, oh, Luna, okay. Um, so, again, you want to call her back and you want to spend a little bit of time. Without being uh, too, uh, too overly emotional, you just want to kind of address it in a somewhat neutral, positive tone. Um, okay. Uh, uh, that she stayed in the room for the rest of the day. She's really sensitive. She okay, so that's kind of the skittishness thing that I was talking about. She finally came out today. She's so much more relaxed and respects Luna. Um, and, and, and again, your dog learns. Dogs learn seniority in the home. And I said that in I think my first episode or third episode or something episode. Um, if anybody knows which one, please put it in the comments. So your dog learns the seniority in the home. And we can do that lovingly and firmly by just separating the dog's behavior from one dog to the next. And again, on the seniority basis of it. And um, okay, so she moves out of her way, uh, out of out of the uh, the nine uh, the, the blind Dane's way. She also doesn't have the anxiety of trying to figure out her place in the pack. My wife and I, uh, uh, you know, head the pack. Right, you guys are your parent. You guys are, are your pack's parents. Uh, she also doesn't have uh, the anxiety of trying to figure out her place in the pack. Um, okay, blah, blah, blah. Uh, the other three play and do their thing. I think establishing yourself as the leader of the pack is so important. Uh, John actually said alpha, but I said leader. Um, then I'm going to transition you, John, from alpha to leader to, to parent. Okay, so um, uh, my wife and the leader pack, Luna, is untouchable. So I'm going to assume Luna is the 10-year-old, Blind Dane. Uh, the other three, okay, da-da-da. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, I think it's important establishing yourself as alpha of the pack is so important, especially with these larger dogs. I can't include Luna anymore on adventures, but I take our other three everywhere I go. Uh, you know, when it comes to uh, a blind dog, um, we can talk about that on the phone next time, John, because um, I have some great ways. Uh, I've worked with blind and or deaf dogs in the past, aside from having my own uh, great partially blind and deaf, but I've worked with uh, families that have uh Deaf and, you know, the double marrows because those uh, disgusting backyard breeders um, <laughs> work with them just to create self-esteem issues, uh, to create self-esteem uh, building uh, techniques uh, for blind and deaf dogs, especially 
blind dogs um, that will allow them to have a bit more freedom and safety. And it's just really simple things that work, and it's worked with other people that I've helped. Um, people see their heads out of the van, and I invite them to come and say hi. No aggression or protective issues. They just hang out. Again, my dogs are so different from what you deal with. Most, You know what the thing is, John? Like I said before, is to you... And to me, we just have a different perspective, a different scale of things. So to you, you've got five dogs that you're dealing with at that point, and, and you've got to work with them with what you do, and that's coming out of your heart. So it is 100% important to you. It's 100% relevant to you. It's 100% um, uh, beneficial to you. It, it's, it's positive. It's beautiful. So we do that. Uh, most folks are, aren't dealing with dogs in the red zone like you do. Oh, well, okay, all right. Thank you. Uh, I think a lot of the problems are they encourage behaviors when the pup is 30 pounds and those behaviors continue when the dog is 120 pounds or, or bigger. And that's, you know, Great Danes or Mastiffs, and, uh, you know, uh, King Shepherds, etc. cetera, uh, Roddies, uh, um, you know. Uh, these pups need obedience training to understand your alpha. Look at wolf packs. Correct. With a wolf pack, the aspect of that behavior wolf pack is on a predatorial basis and that natural dominance comes in right the dominance that comes in on that codependency point that codependency point is who is it that's going to protect us and the dog that is more reactive emotionally emotionally is going to be the dog that is going to succeed because the emotional dog is not logically driven and, and we'll talk about that in a future part so that's why the dominant aspects that do appear in the wolf pack is just by that natural point of who is going to protect us in the pack? Because here's the thing about science, going back to the, again, science is talking about dogs in a linear analog aspect of it. But then they say, well, but wolves are family. They're familial. They're family. They, they believe in uh, this hierarchy and blah, 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 blah. But then we're going to give them treats because we think the dog is dumb. We think the, the wolf is just this predator, etc. And then you see people who are taking wolves into their sanctuary and playing with the wolves, you know, a year later. So it's a familial aspect of things that the science has that dissonance. Dissonance between science and, and just intuition. So they're separating that part. And, and that's why we say in, in the wolf pack part, the dominant is not an aspect. It's a codependency basis of it. Um, okay, so yeah. And, 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 and again, right there, there it is right here. Look at wolf packs. There's only one alpha pair. Establishing leadership isn't yelling and hitting. So there it is, there it is again, man. <laughs> right? The couple that leads the wolf pack is a mom and dad. Do you see the epiphany? Do you see what I struggle with with these uh, these 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 uh, archaic uh, uh, processes of tr dog training when they're going wolf pack, right? The alpha and all that stuff. Right then and there, by the own admission of science itself, alpha pair, mom and dad leading the family. Yes, they're predators, but we go down into the psychological, into the visceral aspect of that, that quantum processing that dogs have. Like we all have a, a quantum processing as well. So somewhat what Einstein said in regards to space time. So it comes to that process like this is what it is. This is what makes sense. Alpha pair. You, you see, do you see what I mean? The, the answers are right in front of us. The answers are right in front of science, but science isn't seeing it because science is like, uh, yeah, no way that dog can have sentience and they can't have intuition and they can't have emotions and they can't feel. And then a hundred years later, well, maybe dogs might be feeling like a two or three year old child in cognitive, uh, cogn cognitive and emotional process. So it's like, hello. And then, you know what, in another 50 years, oh, you know what, dogs are emotional and then I'll be right and I'll be dead. But by then, because I'll be, you know, over a hundred by then. Um, but uh, then science will be like, oh yeah, you know what, maybe that James guy knew what he was talking about because he, you know, um, because, but there it is, the, the word yourself. Um, okay, so establishing leadership isn't yelling and hitting right. It's done through discipline in ways they understand, like taking them by the scruff when necessary, but more importantly, positive reinforcement. It's also body language. So when it comes to positive reinforcement, that positive reinforcement, uh, as I was saying the other day, excuse me, about another person, another trainer in the UK who contacted me in regards to bridging, internet, br intermediate bridging, terminal bridging, etc., etc. That positive reinforcement is not positive reinforcement if you start drilling down to it, because a lot of times these trainers, especially the ones with more experience, will start noticing that same, you know, training method. So they're doing the same training technique each time, bum, 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 with the same aspect of it, and as they get 
more and more proficient, the human gets more and more proficient with the dog, they start anticipating what the dog is about to do in that same behavior by rewarding them sooner. That's passive aggressive for one thing, right? That's that aspect of human arrogance. But that's your intuition. That's positive reinforcement proactively, anticipatory. That's the difference. That's what's wrong with intermediate bridging. It's like giving all these fancy names to something as simple as pay attention to your dog, use your intuition. Your intuition, which is your instinct, your logic, that's been developed over a million plus years. You're not going to rely on that. Um, okay, so it's also body language. Exactly, body language. Dogs are reacting to triggers at one-tenth of a second, as I've already proven several times. Another proof of the fact that dogs react at one-tenth of a second. You take a treat, you hold it above your dog's face, and you drop it. Your dog will catch that in midair. If we were to do that, someone to do that with us, you know how many times we've had that game where, you know, you, if you can catch this quarter, I'll drop the quarter. If you can catch it, you get to keep it. What we did as kids, even as adults, we almost never catch it. That's how fast a dog is. The dog is fast, twice as fast as Bruce Lee. Um, okay, so that's how dogs communicate. This is what I believe in, and it's worked for me. I'm far from an expert. I just love dogs. And so, okay. So, uh, yeah. So, so we'll go on that part, John, um, uh, in the future uh, to, to deal with that. Um, okay, let's do that. The next thing I want to talk about here, I'm just going to close out this one. Um, uh, okay, so, yeah. All right. So, so that's essentially it. I just thought I had the other one, but I have somehow lost it. Uh, a couple of things that I had asked people earlier today when I said I was going to um, post about this was uh, if anybody has any suggestions on times to uh, to broadcast. I might broadcast around 5 or 6 p.m. instead. Um, and my nephew would like to see it a little bit sooner before his bedtime. So we'll do that. Okay, so Maria says, um, you know, what about anxiety, digging? Is it medicated, medication or behavioral aspect that is to address it? It's always behavioral. Unless there's a medical significant, you know, moderate to significant medical issue, it's always behavioral. It's psychological. Digging is psychological. Why do they, the medication that vets and, and trainers, and again, I say like, how, how the heck is trainers able to recommend medication? But anyways, whatever. Um, okay, what's that? Um, okay, so, so these anxieties of digging and, and so forth like that, it's all behavioral. It's all a dysfunction. The dysfunction is, is psychological. The medication that is being prescribed to your dog are psychopharmaceuticals. So the, 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 pharmac the big pharma is acknowledging and your vets are acknowledging your dog has psychological issues. Okay? So um, it's frustrating on my end to see stuff like that um, all the time. Um, but again, uh, you know, it's anxiety, uh, the digging and so forth like that. It can be an aspect of interdependency, low self-esteem. Uh, also that part of abandonment issues as well as boredom, uh, depending on how high functioning your dog is. We can actually figure out how smart your dog is by their cognitive and emotional processes and how they react to certain things and what their behaviors are on a normal basis, on the behaviors when it's react. Uh, when your dog is reacting to certain stimulus or how your dog behaves in the home as well, how much water they drink, how their tongue behavior, uh, uh, their tongue behavior is, how the dog's tail is, is moving. All these things are indicative of dog's psychological processing. Um, and then uh, Amy, who uh, is coming to my uh, group session um, later on this month uh, through Second Chance in Life Rescue Foundation. And I want to thank Grace uh, for um, um, setting me up like seven group sessions and they were all booked. Uh, full right away pretty well so I want to thank that uh, that uh, uh, incredible effort and that that honor as well uh, thank you Grace um, okay so Amy says uh, fear of noises and how to deal with meeting new people when skittish okay so the fear of noises is going to be an aspect then more than anything else either the dog was in a shelter or the dog was outside um, as a stray dog more than likely from from just like the one sentence here it's hard to really infer too much but I would suggest uh, I'm suggesting that your dog was a stray dog and that was uh, brought into a shelter system uh, no a stray dog brought into a foster like a home to be fostered and then was brought over here so that would happen to it um, when when the fear of noises you know there's a big thing that people have to realize when you're adopting a dog from a different country or even a different city the the 
the smell in this city is going to be considerably different. The accents of people talking, right? Because the dog's paying attention to, to those little tiny the, the changes in the tone of voice, right? How I say stop, somebody else in another country is going to say stop totally different or not be able to say it at all because it's an English word. So um, keep in mind that the dog themselves is going to be in a tough position in a foreign area. It'd be the same if you, you know, you, your boss says to you, we're going to send you out to, uh, you know, 500 miles away. You're going to go work with this person that you've never met before. And then you get to the hotel room that you're sharing the hotel room with, which I absolutely hate doing that because everybody always snores. Um, so you're sharing a hotel room with this coworker that you've never met before. And it turns out to be this person that is, you know, uh, um, looking uh, uh, someone that you can't trust. What are you going to do? You're going to feel really on tense tension. You're going to hide your your you're going to hide your watch. You're going to hide your cell phone. You're going to hide your valuables from this person. And it could turn out that this person is some beautiful soul. But right off that part, you're like, I don't trust you. I don't know what to do. I don't know who you are. I'm not going to leave my cell phone in case you steal it and disappear. You know, and quit. So what? That you've stolen my cell phone. So there's that part of understanding that a, a dog coming to this country from even another city i mean is going to have uh, concerns and they will have be processing a, a different smell culture shock right they'll be processing that they'll feel the humidity in the air um, they will feel the difference in the electrostatic uh, energy that's in the air right because we've got power lines and everything's in a different voltage here as well uh, 110 versus 220 who knows what the lines are at because they get converted downward but again they're going to be sensitive to absolutely everything that goes on i've taken dogs to um to off-leash park areas which are underneath power lines and if you ever done that don't ever take your dog to an off-leash area where power lines are go and touch your dog's fur you can feel it electrified when you touch it uh, touch the fur when you touch it it's it's really gross you can feel a little bit of a shock and it's gross and if your dog's feeling it and i'm feeling it just get out of there and don't go there go somewhere else um, but yeah, so going to that part of meeting people and the fear and the skittishness, those things are easy to address and that's going to be in the Minky video, which I will, um, I'll put a link in, in, in the description after I finish, uh, reviewing all this. Um, okay. So let's go back to what, uh, Tanya wrote down. Tanya, are you still there? I want to make sure you're still there. So I don't want to respond, um, without too much info. I have two dogs. A five and a half year old uh, GSD uh, and and Lexi. So uh, I'm not sure uh, what is uh, your first dog's name. I don't know. Uh, Lexi, a Rhodesian Staffy, adopted my dog. Aggressive. Who did? Who did? Okay, sorry. My dog aggressive did. Who will five next week? All right, sorry. Uh, I'm not really sure what that means. Lexi used to be dog friendly. Was it yes? Okay. Oh, you still? Okay, great. Uh, Lexi used to be dog friendly, but has been attacked while walking in lead by an off lead. Oh, okay. So you must be in the UK or something. Uh, lead. All right. So let me read that again. I have two dogs, five and a half year old. Um, and what is your dog's, what is your five and a half year old uh, uh, German uh, dog's name? Um, and Lexi. Um, who did well? Who, who aggressive did it? Who, uh, oh, my dog, aggressive dog, who will be five next week. I think that's what you're saying. Lexi used to be dog friendly, but has been attacked while walking uh, in, in, on lead while off leash. As soon as Lexi sees another dog, her threshold is a far distance. She lunges, growls, barks. Unfortunately, my, now my GST is becoming reactive by copying Lexi. I walk them both separately to work on their behaviors. Okay. Oh, you're in Australia. All right. So the way you say stop is different than the way I say stop. But your dog understands it there. My dog understands it here. If we were to switch dogs, they would eventually learn within about a day of, of our accent. Okay, so I, I spoke about this in another article about um, another uh, broadcast about uh, being off leash, uh, having being a, a dog being attacked by off leash dogs. It happened three times in this dog's nine years of uh, first nine years of this dog's life. And so what happens is, um, I'll get you to take a look at that one. It is essentially the fact that to your dogs, you fail to protect them. Family, you fail to protect them. That's what happened. And because you fail to protect uh, uh, Lexi, she can't trust you. Family. So what I say to people as well is if I, uh, you know, if you lend someone $20 and they don't pay you back, 
and then a week later they don't pay you back and then a month later they don't pay you back and then you see them on Facebook and they're out partying in, in, in some great off you know at the bar and they're partying they've got selfies and all that stuff and you're thinking to yourself you owe me 20 bucks and you're out partying and then they finally pay you back because you say hey I saw you out partying so where's my 20 bucks man and then they pay you the 20 bucks when will be the next time? When will the next time be that you'll lend them $20 again? Never. So your dog has been betrayed by the lack of you protecting her. Lexi has been betrayed. So she has uh, seen the fact that you weren't paying attention to what's going on, etc., etc. We have to go in a little bit more detail about that part. Um, and then you're saying that... Um, sorry, what was your other dog's name? I'm sorry. It's just I can't go back here. Let me just see here. Lexi also resource guards and doesn't let my uh, uh, oh Rocco okay touch toys or allow him in certain spots. So that means that Lexi has a has a low self esteem and, and uh, um, somewhat a bit higher codependency aspect of it. Which means that by what you're writing and the way you're writing about it means that she's paying attention to you. You give her a lot of attention, but then you also have that tendency to kind of stop it with her without letting her know when you're stopping it. And so of course that causes her to have low self esteem. Um, Okay, so uh, she doesn't let Rocco touch the toys, etc. Lexi was born on a puppy farm and removed from her mother after birth. Wow. Uh, ideally, it's five, uh, it's eight to ten weeks of age, so so that's kind of a drag. Um, sorry, uh, Rita, I'm going to have to talk about that next time because Tanya was here and I went through a, little bit, a bit of time here. I tried my absolute best to protect her. I've gotten savagely bitten and nearly lost a finger. Um, I think uh, Stephanie uh, from another um, group, um, she actually had her finger bitten off uh, by a neighbor's dog that tried to attack her dog. And um, it was amazing because Stephanie uh, has said uh, it's not the dog's fault. And so she never had uh, animal control involved with it. And, you know, that's rescue. It's a kind of a different mindset. Um, so, you know, there's a different type of heart in, in people. It's all different. Uh, different values of that and it's a scale and it's what we are uh, the, the, we know what we can do and we also know what we're willing to do um, so you know Stephanie and same with yourself Tanya is being willing to accept things like only nearly lost a finger and so forth like that right that's your willingness to to be committed to your dog versus other people who may not have that same high tolerance and might uh, unfortunately you know kill their dog uh if you have to kill you know if you're if, if somebody out there's a thing about killing your dog just surrender your dog to rescue if you have a dog that you see behaviors that might be cute now like little play by it mouthing and all that stuff don't let that get out of the way because then that dog of yours becomes um further victimized in the future when you're there saying i, I don't know what happened to the dog and now my dog used to be perfect now my dog's horrible we all can do accident reconstruction, so let's go on that part here. So yeah, so when it comes to um, um, to Lexi in, in regards to her behavior, uh, what you're going to have to do next time when you're on leash is you're going to be more consistent on your leash. You're not going to be somewhat spaghettiing it, like I said before, like rolling it up in your hand and showing nervousness. Uh, if you give your dog a six-foot lead, it's always got to be six feet. You can, you can hold it on one hand at the end of it because your dog sees the end of the leash. You take your other hand and you can use that to bring it in, uh, bring in the leash, right? So that if your dog on the end, your dog will still know that you still have it at the end of the leash. It's, it's something a bit more complicated in the discussion for another time. Um, and then we can kind of go from there. Uh, what did you say? Ooh, why is that? Um, I, don't, I, don't, I didn't blame the dog and request it. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't killed. It's the owner's fault for not having their dog on lead. Amazing. Absolutely amazing. I thought it was your own dog, and even more amazing the fact that it's somebody else's dog. So um, you know, uh, so that that's really actually just just gorgeous, just gorgeous. Uh, okay, so so um, how how is Rocco overall? Um, did I read that part? Maybe you can put in Rocco. Doesn't let Rocco touch toys and all that stuff. So then Rocco is getting somewhat suppressed in that part of it, and so that also indicates that. Uh, Lexi tends to, uh, oh, uh, uh, Rocco Lexi Jinx. Oh, I see that's you. You have a dog named Jinx as well then, right? Uh, see, and I say you had at least three dogs. So um, there we go. Okay. Um, so what's going to happen with Lexi is then she's going to start developing that desperation to be protected. And Rocco is going to be reacting to that because what Rocco is doing is he's being irritated by Lexi. 
he's getting choked at Lexi being like that. And then he's like, ah, and then Roxy, he's, but he's got to trust Roxy at the same time. So then he goes, okay, well, if Lexi is doing, I'm sorry, he's got to trust Lexi at the same time. So he's thinking to himself, well, if Lexi is like this, because there must be a reason because my owner, my human, my parent can't protect me. Then Lexi must have a reason and I have to be afraid. I'm going to go after that as well because I'm with Lexi and I'm with my human, but my human can't protect us. So me and Lexi have to do the heavy lifting. When you wrote earlier, I think that, um, you know, for you said that I think Lexi can see a dog down the block, right? You know, uh, you guys use meters there, right? Metric system like we do here. Okay. So say, for example, you know, you're, I think you said that you're, you know, see your dog just down the road or whatever. So even 150, 200 meters away, uh, Lexi starts getting reactive. Why is she getting reactive? Well, here's the thing. First, she was already attacked while on leash. So right off the bat, everything is a threat to her in regards to another dog, especially if the dog's off leash. She doesn't know if the dog that's on leash with somebody else is going to be on leash or off leash at any time because her trust has been shattered. Then that part of seeing the other dog that's 200 meters down the road, right? We'll even say 200 meters, right? So even that to, to your dog, that dog that's 200 meters away is about five, five and a half seconds away at full sprint, right? When the two dogs go to fight each other, they'll cover ground. It's about five and a half seconds away. To your dog, abstract memory, it's instant. If I don't react now, I'm going to get attacked because my parent, my human can't protect me. So what you got to do in those senses of it is when she starts to act up, when she starts to get reactive, and same with Rocco, you're going to have to watch Rocco as well. You're going to have to correct them both, but you're going to have to correct Lexi first because Lex, uh, yeah, because Lexi is the one that is being reactive first. And Lexi is the one who's going to start doing that. And what happens is it'll get to a point, and you probably have had this happen now, where Lexi starts to get a little bit reactive, but she doesn't do anything, and then Rocco goes off the handle instead, and then Lexi joins him. So that's creating issues on Rocco's side as well. But when it comes to Lexi, correct her right away. Pay attention to, to Lexi. Look at Lexi 90% of the time. Look at your environment 10% of the time. Look at Lexi 90% of the time. Watch her behavior. Watch her. Like I said about internet bridging, it's not internet bridging. It's passive aggressive aspects of it. Be proactive. Watch her. And when you start to see her starting to react, then you do your accent reconstruction. Then you start seeing the nuances of behaviors that she's exhibiting before it actually happens. Because she's seen that dog even before she starts to react. So if you're paying attention, you will see that happen as the dog is reacting. And then you go, oh, okay, at that time she started to do this, etc., etc. And I think uh, Stephen Elliott had said to me before, um, you know, uh, the dog's in front. The problem is you can't see what the dog is doing, right? And and that's true. So if you're actually paying attention to your dog's behavior, uh, for me, I can tell what the dog is doing in the front of their heads and their faces, what they're looking at and so forth by watching the back of their head and their behavior. So you're watching the dog's behavior, the nuances, how they sort of turn, the kind of stutter, stop their walk, uh, start, stutter, stop their, their head movements, etc. You can then understand what the dog is doing. The dog is getting ready to react because you're now matching that behavior from two steps removed by putting one, two, three together. And then you get logic. It, it all makes sense. So just have to be more attentive. Um, okay. Let's just see. No way. You're so cute, Tanya. Um, uh, okay. So Rocco has become a very scared dog. Well, there you go, right? So. I had I didn't even read that, and as I said, Rocco is now going like, okay, what's going on? And then he starts to react. So he, he's become a very scared dog. He was very confident, but not anymore. Rocco does hide behind me when Lexi snarls or, or bears her teeth. Uh, I was told by behaviors to get rid of one of them, which I don't do. Hey, you know what? I have five dogs. I've had six here. They're all reactive, except for Sammy, and they're all dog reactive, and they're all there to attack either themselves, each other. Or they're out there to attack other people, etc. And then I get them out there by working with them. By not being alpha like John was saying in that part of, of the family, but by being the parent. Right? I mean, I grew up in a family of eight. So if you have, uh, you know, if you grew up in a three or more kids in your family, you know what it's like. You know your parents. The law is the law. You can keep pushing your parents and one day it's like, all right, that's it. This is the law. What, what does everybody say? Okay. 
that's what we do. They're not intimidated. They're like, okay, yeah, all right, pay attention, okay, haha. So um, that's that's where uh, you want to address those things because for Rocco, he is learning that if you can't even protect the family, her, like Lexi, you, and him, because Lexi has to do your job, and then you've abdicated your role in leading and taking care and par parenting the family, then Rocco's like, holy crud. Now, if my human can't do it and Lexi can't do it, where is it going to leave me? And Rocco is just basically just going to shut down. And then he's going to start reacting because he's going to get one day something's going to happen to him and he's going to be off his, uh, off his safe hiding place from you. So how do you work the two of them together? Address Lexi right away. Um, you know, and I don't know who Jinx is. I would assume, I mean, either that or that's your last name. Uh, I would assume that that's your, uh, Jinx is your other dog. But again, correct Lexi at all times. Don't spaghetti, don't roll up the, the leash. Correct Lexi at all times. And when you correct her, like, Lexi, stop. Make sure your leash is firm. Make sure she's not pulling you off your feet. Lexi, stop. When Lexi stops, even if it doesn't seem like she's stopping, good girl. Good girl. Because to her, she's complied to you. Even if it's only 99% of that compliance that you want her to, or 1% of that compliance that you want her to do 100%, she's still complying. So when she is complying, oh, okay, uh, Jinx is your cat. Ha <laughs> ha. Okay, well, you can't really put a cat on a leash out there. Um, but so when your dog is complying, when Lexi is complying, you have to acknowledge that she is complying. Same thing, human analogy again. Same thing when, you know, if you have a little kid, you have a son or daughter and your child comes up to you and goes, mom, 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 like the family guy thing, right? Mom, 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 mom. If you don't acknowledge your child, they're going to just feel, one, like mom doesn't care about me anymore and they're going to feel devalued. And then, then you go, okay, what do you want? And then they say, oh, mom, I drew this for you. And you, you look at this car, crayon. And, yeah. And you look at this crayon and you'll be like, oh, yeah, this crayon just, it's going to go in the garbage. All right? This crayon drawing is going to go in the garbage. But you still have to, what do you say to your kid, though? Oh, my gosh, that's so beautiful. I'm going to save that. I'm going to put that away somewhere. You're acknowledging your dog's behavior in the same way. You're asking them to comply. You're asking them not to be reactive to the other dog. You're telling them you've already got it set. You already know things are going to happen. It's another step in that regards of uh, reacting with a dog. Um, don't change direction. Oh, no. No. Never. Never change direction. If she, if she doesn't go off first, Rocco will then let Lexi will join in. Uh, okay, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Don't, don't ever let your dog... And that's another thing too, right? Constantly, constantly, uh, owners that hire me um, and people that I, I do some pro bono stuff with, they all say the same thing. Yeah, we were told by the trainer, the behaviors that uh, if we see danger to walk away, to change direction, to, to go off somewhere, to, to step to the side, etc., etc. What do you think you're teaching your dog? Exactly. Right? I don't even have to say the answer, but I'm going to because I, I have to because I'm only talking to myself, I think, sometimes. But um, what do you think your dog is feeling when you change direction? It's counterintuitive. You're saying to your dog that that danger is dangerous and I can't protect you. So we're going to run away. We're going to go off to the side. We're going to go off to the side somewhere. I'm trying to keep this in frame so it doesn't look like it's on, I'm crazy. But going off to the side to hide. I can't protect you anymore. I'm hiding. We're hiding from the danger. And the dog could be a little chihuahua. We're hiding from the danger. I can't protect you. And then what does Lexi think? Yep. Mom can't protect me. I knew I can't trust her. Codependency. Family. Do you see what I mean? That's where it all comes down to. It's logical. If you use a logic that we intuitively have from a million years of evolution when we were cave people, troglodytes, Neanderthals, right? When we were dumb, <laughs> this, right? We, we learn to fear danger and we run away. And if we have the alpha, the family, the parent, the leader running away from danger, 
Like I said the other day too, you're in a group of friends and you're walking down the street and someone just comes out of the blue and starts punching you in the face and beating the heck out of you and your friends just stand there going, oh geez, that guy, um, uh, he's going to beat the crap out of my friend. And then you get up and you're like, how come nobody joined in and helped and stopped this guy from, from, from beating me up? The next time you walk with your friends, you will never ever trust them again. You change direction. You're never going to instill in your dog the confidence of what's going on. When you go off that sidewalk, the sidewalk, right? That is a wildlife corridor. The dog, the animal, the human knows when you're on the sidewalk and when you're in the grass. The dog knows when you're deviating of it because all the dog has to do is just hear your, the, the sound of your footsteps. And if it's changed from the pavement steps to the grass, your dog already knows, okay, we're screwed. Okay. Uh, yes, that makes sense. Shall I walk her with a muzzle? I don't want her to bite another dog and have her taken away. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Where, use what makes you feel safe as well. What makes you feel confident? Um, you know, uh, again, I say try not to wear a prong collar. Uh, try not to use a shock collar. Try not to use a, a slip collar. Uh, if you have a muzzle on her, then that's awesome because then you don't have to worry about using those brute force devices. They're so archaic and they're just such an unskilled device used by professionals. Uh, when it comes to people like your, uh, you know, regular people like yourself, if you have to use it, then it's, then, you know, if it makes you feel confident, then use it. But when it comes to the professionals, uh, get away from that. If you get, a, if those professionals get away from using prong and shock collars, means that they have to start working harder. It means that they have to start understanding what's going on with their dog. Understanding what goes on with your dog. Understanding what goes on with all dogs. As opposed to say, well, I'm just going to brute force this dog and hurt them, and then the dog's going to comply. You know, if if your partner started beating the heck out of you to get you to do something, oh my gosh, that's gorgeous. Prong colors are illegal in Australia. Wow. Uh, I've been trying to go after the Ministry of a uh, Agriculture here, uh, Min uh, Honorable Minister uh, Lana pop them to change the laws here she doesn't care i can tell you when election comes up i'm going to really work towards that party not being elected and we have a petition i have a petition that has over a hundred thousand signatures uh to criminalize dog and cat meat and um, i'm going to work hard to make sure she doesn't get reelected, for sure absolutely going to make sure um so when when it comes to that part of uh, feeling confident with uh with when walking with your dog that's what you want to do is keep the muzzle on makes you feel better when you're walking you see her starting to react right away right away correct her don't let her get away with things in that sense and don't be a jerk about it just give her a simple correction don't play tug of war with her body or you just want to give her enough of a correction so that she feels what's going on just like as if you're just tapping your friend stop it stop it that kind of tap then they understand but if you're using more than enough force then it's overkill. Your dog doesn't understand the relational level of force to their reaction. Just like, you know, with using deadly force, it only escalates when it's needed. You want to match it as much as you can. And if you want to and you need to, then you bring it up a little bit. Uh, with the guys that I have here, the Danes, because they're such reactive dogs in the beginning, I'm using force extremely high because, again, in regards to them, they're lunging at other people. They are uh, uh, they are lunging and they are attempting to uh, attack and hurt people, etc., etc. So um, they're digging in two to three times their body weight, which at 150, 180 pounds is over 500 pounds of, of digging power. So I have to use much more force, but I always use enough force to get them back, not taking them off their front feet keeping them on the ground as much as possible as horizontal or lower down in that sense so that they're not able to go up so high I can uh, uh, secure and then when they're not pulling anymore then I relax the leash right away because otherwise you're playing tug of war you don't want to play tug of war with your dog because when your dog's like okay this is just usual behavior for my own, my, my humans anyway so I don't care but if you give them just enough then your dog realizes oh well, I'm not getting pulled 
And anybody who's worked with me knows that when we're out there working on leash with their dog, that your that I teach them how so your dog can learn what the six foot lead length is, and they automatically know that. And then your dog after their dogs almost after two to three times, just two to three times, already know their lead length, and they're no longer yanking and pulling on it. And that's for the average dysfunctional dog, not for the dogs like Minky or Diesel or, uh, you know, Nero, Walter, uh, Aunt, uh, William, etc. right? Those, those dogs are a little bit more higher. But again, I use enough force to hold them back and bring them back. And then I still relax and I still thank them. And I mean, there's been times where, you know, they're pulling me off my feet and I'm digging in and they're yanking me and I finally get them to stop pulling and they stop pulling and they're barking and then I get them to stop yelling and they stop and then I say, thank you. And I'm out of breath, but I say thank you. And so it's always acknowledging that your dog's behavior is being appreciated. Because again, they're like a two to three year old child. So when Lexi is doing this and she's freaking out, just give her enough to hold her back. Don't let her pull you. Don't let her pull you off the sidewalk into the grass. If it comes to a point where you're walking past another dog, etc., as you get closer and closer, correct her, correct her, correct her, correct her. Thank you. Good girl, Lexi. Good girl, Lexi, blah, 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 and then you go from it. Okay, let's see. Um, and I'm going to go to Rita's one because I think I'm, holy cow, I'm like uh, over an hour now, and, I, and I'm just like, uh, I didn't think I was, actually, when I started this, I thought it was going to be like 20 minutes, and I'm like, woohoo, you guys are making me work for my money, which is no money. Um, please make sure to share my page. Please make sure to, to subscribe to my channel. Please help get my word out. I mean, the stuff I'm talking about, it makes sense, and it works, and I can honestly, 100% proof to you it works 100% with every single dog, no matter how extremely dangerous, no matter how significant. Dogs that have attacked people viciously more than a dozen times, it works with every single dog. It's not science-based, it's intellectually based. It's counter, it's, 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 it counters everything that's out there in science. It's so dumb what those guys are doing. Um, okay, so Rita says, it never worked, now I get it. Yeah, about turning around, right? Turning away, it doesn't work, now you get it, okay? I started talking to dog owners approaching us saying, stop, my dog is scared instead. And then she, uh, your dog Giro would look up at me and say, what's this new technique? And she'd be able to sit quietly with other dogs as close as two meters, which was sort of a miracle. So you're using the, 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 the intuition that you have, Rita. It makes sense, right? Because I know you sent me the thing and I said to you, could you structure it a little bit better? And then, um, well, yeah, thank you as well, um, Tanya. Um, you know, uh, again, please share. Please share it in some groups if you can. And just get the word out. I, this, like I say, this is all for free. Uh, and I'm going to continue doing this as much as I can for free, right? Like I said, I don't have any ads on my website. And, I, and I'm and i self-funded. And I and I don't I honestly don't make a lot of money. I, I drive a little tiny old ha hybrid that's six years old now. Um, but I love what I do. I love the gift that God has given me to share with the rest of the world. And all the stuff just makes sense, right? You're not using any treats or medication as well, Tanya. Um, and you'll see that. And you'll see it working. Just like Rita has said the same thing is just using basics. The, the, the difference is, yes, I'm reading dogs at two-tenths of a second. The stuff that you're writing down here, which is kind of funny because I'll see in other groups, that, like, especially reactive dog groups, are like, you should never, you know, no one's allowed to give advice online about reactive dogs unless you've met the dog in person, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I'm like, oh gosh, that's that's because that's they're so like childish. Go to my website, rfarfbarkbark.com. Go look under the tab, help for your dogs, and it's free help, right? You join my group, read the screenshots of people, and Rita, you've seen this in my closed group. Read the screenshots of people who have. Just written down the description of their dog and posted clear photos of their dog's eyes, face, and body. Thank you. Thank you, Tanya. And, and the clear eyes, right, photos of their dogs. And I've done a psychological evaluation that is so accurate. Owners are like, how do you even know this? And you can read that in those posts. So I'm not embellishing. And then I give them a remedy of what to do. And that remedy works 100% across the entire board. And the thing I always say to people is just practice, practice, practice. Don't get past your, your, you know, the progress that you can achieve. And if all else fails, go back to square one because that's where your technique starts from. Um, but yeah, so you see all these techniques will work. Again, Tanya, don't let them pull away, right? Don't let her anxiety get pulled up. Pay attention to her 90% of the time, 10% on the environment, 90% on your dog. Watch, watch, watch. And you can tell, correct her right away. 
with just enough. And then, good girl, Lexi. Like, she went potty. You know the time when your dog goes out to go pee? You got to go leave somewhere. And you got to bring her with you. And you just want her to go pee. And you're like, please just go pee. And then you finally go pee. And you're like, good girl, Lexi. Good girl. That's a kind of joy that you want to give them when they correct, when you're correcting them, right? When you when you correct and they're correcting themselves, good girl, because then that's a praise. And then you see, just like any child, see them start to flourish. See them start to rely. And she will say to you in her own head, Lexi will, will be like, because if you react, if you're seeing stuff that's going on and you're correcting Lexi before it happens and she sees that, you're correcting it, what she's saying to you then is going, my gosh, mom, you actually saw that now for the first time. You saw the danger and you're now finally addressing it. And then she gets more and more confidence in you. And it goes on and on and on. And it's just a beautiful system. And um, uh, there's no medication or treats. You'll see it working. You see the Minky video. Like I said, I'll post that Minky video. Um, you know, even like Gordon, the disabled bulldog, the same aspects of that part as well nobody could touch him totally different type of dysfunctions totally different type of frustration you can see the neurological effects of the tongue behavior as it curls up and so forth all that part is completely different it is completely esoteric to the dog training industry as well and how to deal with that because every person said that dog, every professional said that uh, gordon should be killed there's never any hope no one's ever going to pick him up etc etc his foster sent me videos of her picking him up and he's she'll go outside to the patio and he'll crawl himself over uh, from the living room into the patio to be with with uh, with uh, his foster to hang out with her. So all of this is dealt with because we're addressing the dog as if we're familial. We're talking to our dogs in conversation. We're talking to our dogs as part of our family. And then the dog understands like, oh, yeah, yeah okay, cool. Now I'm understood. You don't go out with somebody and fall in love with them unless you know that they help mend your broken pieces. Right? True love. That's what we all look for, right? Oh my gosh, I'm going to get sad here. So that's what we all look for. And that's what your dog is looking for. Because the reality is, right? What is true love? You know, and we know it's like the 25th or 30th anniversary of the Princess Bride and all that stuff. But what is true love? Right? True love is loving somebody 100% and they love you 100%. And it's reciprocal and all that stuff. True love is that thought that I could never, you know... I would give my life to save theirs. If they needed a, a kidney, I would give my kidney to them. I would do what I could to save their life. That's true love. Your dog is willing to give her life to save yours, to defend you. That's true love. You know, there's that uh, that saying that, um, uh, which we call it, uh, um, it's famously attributed to, unfortunately, to Keanu Reeves, which I don't think he's the one that said it, but there's a picture of Keanu Reeves holding a shirt or, or something that says, the dog is the only uh, creature on earth that loves you more than he loves himself which is totally stupid because it's impossible to love more than a hundred percent and it's impossible to love something else more than you love themselves than, than yourself it's impossible to love something more than you love yourself because to love something more than you love yourself is no longer love it's infatuation There's lots of stuff that uh, uh, just needs a little bit of more forethought into things um, because we are too busy anthropomorphizing our emotions onto dogs thinking all this. Um, but anyhow, so this is the end of my, my thing, you know, hour and a half later. Um, so please, again, share my stuff, uh, my posts, uh, subscribe to my YouTube channel. Please help me get the word out. The more people that share, the more new owners will see and understand what I'm doing and they'll 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 learn how to work with their dogs. People who have two dogs like yourself, Tanya, Rita as well, out in Norway, people who have more than one dog will learn that there are more things that can be done for dogs when you have behaviors like that, Rita telling you, you know, get rid of, or Tanya getting rid of a dog, one of your dogs, you know, it's like, might as well give away one of your kidneys, right? Uh, same thing with you, Rita, people telling you this, uh, you know, it just doesn't make, it's, it's dumb. Our job is to keep our family together. You know, that's what we look for. I mean, that's what I look for. I look for true love, right? And that's that most magical, amazing part of us that our soul starts to sing. And we want to find that. And your dog is there. Your dog is willing to give absolutely everything that she has to save your life. So we need to respect that. We need to treat our dogs as family. We need to talk to them as family, as truly in that conversation, as truly inclusive as truly understood as our dependence with love and just do these amazing, beautiful, gorgeous things that we can achieve.
anyhow, uh, my battery, which was full, is now at 15%. So um, uh, I will do another broadcast tomorrow. Um, you know, and the thing is, I know I could do 10 years worth of daily bar broadcasts and, and, and just start to kind of go 50% of what I know about what's going on. I mean, you know, the predatorial dogs, the, the, the submerged psychology of those dogs, they're layered, uh, dogs having dreams and nightmares, uh, those aspects of re psychological reflection. Uh, the, the, the stuff that is out there about dogs is phenomenal. And again, you know, tuning my own horn, if I wasn't right about absolutely every single thing that I said, I would be dead. I would be killed. I would be horrifically torn apart by dogs. And you can look online. You can Google BC Dog Whisperer. You can see my articles in the uh, not my article coverage on me on the front page of the newspapers and all that stuff. Full page articles about my work, national television, about all that stuff. And instead of me embracing the financial aspects like the $400, $300 an hour behaviors, wearing Gucci's, I'm a Costco Levi's jeans kind of guy. I, 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 I give away way more in pro bono than I do in, in what I make in a year. In a, like in a month, I give away a lot. And it's because I really truly believe we need to help dogs and change the way the world sees dogs so that we're not killing here in North America 6 million dogs annually for behavioral issues um okay so uh next week uh sorry tomorrow I'll, I'll do another broadcast i might i will probably do it earlier in the day i'll try to do it around 5 or 6 p.m since i don't have any sessions tomorrow um and i'll try to do an earlier time frame just so more people can uh, see it while it's live and ask questions thank you all so much um you know thank you for those who have shared my my posts and um um you know any questions Put it in the comments. I read them. I can't answer them all, but I'll read them and then I'll uh, figure out what we can talk about tomorrow. Okay? Goodbye.